grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with each of you this morning. It's great to have you here on this, this beautiful Chiefs Sunday. <laughs> so, I told everybody to wear red, so I got my red Chiefs socks on. And some people in my line of work would call this the Pentecost soul. Um, it's serving a different purpose today. <laughs> as is as is doing. And I'll probably have to answer for that on Judgment Day. I fully realize that. <laughs> no, we're, we're going for it. Um, a couple things before I, I got a few announcements, but first of all, we got a, most importantly, we've got a couple birthdays. One that's coming up, and Linda Norman's having a, a birthday. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I know that because Mary said you were. <laughs> On Saturday, the seventeenth, and also Pat Good's birthday is today. So. talk about it a little bit more toward the end of the sermon, but, you know, Ash Wednesday is a, kind of the starting line. It, it kicks off the Lenten season, and Lent is really a journey. It's a journey to the cross, where we, we focus kind of an inward introspection sort of thing. Is we ask God to show us what parts we played in Him having to die for us on the cross, so that we can get in touch with those, seek God's forgiveness. Experience the resurrection of Easter, and then we get on with, with serving. But it's an important journey, and every journey's got a, got a starting point. And Lent is the starting point of our, I mean, Ash Wednesday is the starting point of our, of our Lenten journey. So I invite everyone to come and, and take part in that on Wednesday evening. Um, the other thing I want to mention is, well, two, two things, is Feed My Starving Children. That's coming up real quick, less than a month away, on March 8th and 9th, and it's really become an institution here, not just in our church, but in the Jackson community, and our church is, is kind of the, the leader, quarterback of it. So next week and the following week, for all three services, Todd Rushing and crew will have their, their folks um, where you can sign up for what session you want to work, and also you can buy a t-shirt, which I think are $15.70, whatever they are, the bullets. But for the next two weeks, um, Todd and his crew will be have a table back there, and you can sign up for the the, the packing session that you would like to work. Um, the other thing, construction. You might have noticed. I don't know how many of y'all looked downstairs when you came in. Anybody? It looks kind of like a garage. <laughs> they've got the they've got somebody last night asked, "Is that the color of the floor is going to be down there?" Because it's just it looks like a garage floor. It's just the first layer. It's the stuff that they are going to glue the tiles to, I guess. But anyway, they've got that in, and all the tiles are here, so they'll start laying tiles next week. I would assume by the time we gather next week, we'll have a floor in place. That's the plan, anyway. Um, so, and these two bathrooms are, are still off limits. They were, they were working during the week, and then sometime, I guess Friday, they had to, I don't know, did something, so they're off limits again. So, Downstairs, if you need to use the restroom, both of those downstairs. And the last thing is, I want to welcome our Breaking Bonds guys that joined us for worship this morning. So, thank you, Sean, and thank you, Cody, for, for making that happen and getting the fellows here. Um, guys, the same sermon is going to happen at 10 30 as well, so you get to hear it twice. With all that in mind, let's, uh, let's start our worship service. By standing and 
with our core lens right, and then our opening prayer. Father, we invoke your blessings of guidance upon all we do in the name of our Lord. May your Holy Spirit lead us in all we do, and when we're finished with this today, we'll be equipped to go beyond these walls to do the work of ministry. These blessings we ask in Jesus' name, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Remain standing and turn to hymn number 577, God of grace and God of glory. not 
not show your stuff to other people. It wouldn't help your teammates be better soccer players, right? I mean, it's a good thing that you're good at soccer, so you can help your teammates. So you're sharing your talent. What are you good at? Our reading is from Matthew 25, beginning at verse 14. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. 
The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look here, it's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant, if you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least you, I had, could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for the people of God.
when it was reading scripture, but I looked up into the balcony and I saw a bunch of Packers jerseys. <laughs> I know you had a, a Cowboys jersey on under that sweatshirt. I thought that. Steelers. <laughs> That's the deviant section of the. <laughs> <laughs> but we're a welcoming church. <laughs> You know, there's something about sports teams and all this that kind of, it's fun, it just kind of brings us together or separates us. <laughs> it ruined my whole theory. But I, I've always loved competitive sports. In fact, it doesn't have to be an actual sport. I just love healthy competition of, of any kind. And as a kid, when I was in high school, in college, and in the Army, I, I was always on some sort of competitive team. I was intramural in college and in the Army, obviously, but, but I was always on some sort of team. And I was an avid sports actual participant up until it was time for my own boys to take the field and carry on the, the winning competitive spirit tradition. The times have changed. I might have changed a little bit. And, and my approach to competitive sports has, has definitely changed because gone are my, my thrill-seeking super competitive adrenaline junkie days. And nowadays, I satisfy my competitive appetite from the comfort of my living room. Um, and thanks to all the sports channels, ESPN and Fox Sports One and all those, I can relax and I can even take a nap while simultaneously running laps at the Daytona 500 or, or bumping heads with the Chiefs at Arrowhead or turning double plays with the Royals or the Cardinals, except for both definitely turned double plays. But you know what I mean. You know, some might call that lazy on my part, but I call it multitasking. That's how I prefer to look at it. And actually, though, competing in my favorite sports from the comfort of, of my easy chair is, is kind of liberating, actually. Because when I played sports, when I actually played them, I was, I was limited by my ability. Back in the day, it was football, wrestling, and, and baseball. They were about all I did because that's the only thing I had any sort of even an average aptitude for to compete at. But thanks to the, the wide array of TV sports channels, I found that my athletic horizon is unlimited. Now, I'm into all kinds of sports, and not to brag, but I'm finding that I'm good at every sport I watch. <laughs> Pro football, motocross, girls' table tennis, curling. I've yet to find a sport that I'm not good at watching. And I guess you could say that I'm a natural. It's, it's only, it's not bragging, but it's true. So. I'm also much more open-minded about the sports that I participate in from the comfort of my living room. For instance, have you ever, you ever watched those, uh, those X Gamers on ESPN? The X Games? Sort of, it's mostly extreme daredevil sports. You know, these motorcycle dudes that, that do the old look mom, no hands routine while 40 feet up, you know, off the ground doing a flip with the motorcycle. Guys with really long hair and, and, and pierced tattoos riding skateboards down the side of a mountain. Crazy adrenaline junkie stuff that, that if, you, if you mess up, if you lose, you're probably going to end up in a wheelchair or work. Now, Brenda will tell you that I used to be kind of an adrenaline junkie in the younger days, but, but these X gamer dudes, they are over the top. It's this amazing combination of insanity and athleticism. God gave them perfectly good bodies and an, an incredible dose of athletic ability. Now, I personally can't understand why they would risk it all just to pull off some no hands backflip on a motorcycle. Figure what's the point? Kind of a waste. But I will say one thing for these crazy X gamers. They are 100% committed. They are no holding back on those guys. They're 100% all in. And you know, you gotta, you gotta kinda admire someone who's willing to, to risk it all to accomplish their goal. In the case of these, these X game athletes, we may not understand or even agree with their goal, but there is something admirable about their willingness to put it all on the line. Their willingness to just go all in. And I think every one of us disciples actually could, could learn a thing or two, or thing or two from these, these crazy skateboarding 
motorcycle flipping athletes. You know, whatever it is you're into, whether it's your profession or your hobby or, or being a parent or, or a combination of hopefully of all the above, are you all in? Are you 100% all in? Now we're going to come back to that question in a minute. First, let's look at this text that uh, I'm going to read to us. It's a, it's a long text, long, one of the longer readings, so thank you for hanging in there on that. It comes from Matthew 25. Now, Matthew 25 is kind of a unique chapter amongst gospel chapters. Um, it's comprised of three interrelated stories. Um, it's comprised of the parable of the, of the ten bridesmaids, the parable of the talents, or the parable of, of the loan money, as it's called in the New Living Translation that we read from. And then the third, the third part of the chapter is it's kind of a glimpse into the final judgment. It's, that's, it's, it's not really a parable, but it's, a, it's, it's Jesus teaching about how um, in the end, the day of judgment, the goats will be separated from the sheep. And although in all of chapter 25, here's the kind of unique part, all of chapter 25 is unique to Matthew's gospel. And what I mean by that is there's no parallel versions that are found in any of the other gospels. What you read in Matthew 25 is only found in Matthew chapter 25. And all three parts of Matthew 25 are looking ahead to the final judgment. Both the parables begin with, in the same way, the kingdom of heaven will be like. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids. The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. The first two-thirds of the chapter are all about preparing for that final judgment. The final judgment that's described as separating the sheep from the goats. And that's the last one-third of the chapter. And the other thing you might notice about what was just read is that the tone has got kind of a threatening finality to it, doesn't it? If we'd have read the, the parable of the ten bridesmaids, and, and certainly the, not the parable, but the last third about separating the sheep from the goats, they all kind of have this, this tone of urgency, kind of a, a threatening finality to it. The useless servant who's, or, or the ten bridesmaids that get left behind, the useless servant that's, that's thrown, in, thrown into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of Ganashes with teeth. Um, at this point in the gospel, though, I think it kind of makes sense that there's a there's a sense of urgency and a sense of finality to what Jesus is teaching. Because it's crunch time. It's crunch time. This is the last chapter before before Jesus enters that final, at least in Matthew's gospel, before Jesus enters that final journey, the final leg of the journey to the cross and beyond to the empty tomb. That begins in chapter 26. So chapter 25 is time is suddenly compressed as Jesus is coming to the end of his earthly ministry. So there's kind of a threatening, urgent tone of finality that, that's conveyed through this whole chapter. And that's the context. Let's look at the specifics. Now, this master who was going on a trip, he divided up eight bags of silver. Five went to one servant, two went to another servant, and one went to the final servant. So we could ask ourselves right off the bat, why didn't the master distribute those bags of money evenly among the three servants? Well, there's a couple reasons. First one is because three doesn't divide evenly into eight. <laughs> that would be the mathematical reason for it. But more importantly, the master divvied out the bags among the servants according to the servant's ability. In other words, no one received more or less responsibility than they could handle. Now, doesn't that kind of make sense? Don't we don't we see that everywhere in our own in our own lives? How many teachers do we have here? School teachers. Now, when you are going through whether you're a retired teacher, whether you now, when you started out, you started out as a student teacher, right? You didn't start out in the classroom of 30 wild crazy teenagers. You started out as a student teacher under the supervision of somebody else. The same is true in the military. Nobody comes out of college and gets commissioned as a one-star general. No. You get commissioned as a second lieutenant, or you come out of basic training as a, as a private. And you work your way up. You get more responsibility 
as your abilities increase. When I was flying, I came out of flight school as a co-pilot for a long time until I made pilot in command. If I had come out of flight school and they'd have made me a pilot in command, I probably wouldn't be standing here right now. <laughs> Same with password points. When you get out of seminary, or even when you're in seminary, you generally have a smaller church, or two, two or three smaller churches, until you you get the ability and you can take on more responsibilities of a larger church that has a couple campuses. You see, too much responsibility too soon that's the recipe for crash and burn. So back to our parable. The responsibility was given to the servants commensurate with their abilities so that no one would be overwhelmed and therefore have an excuse for failure. Failure can only result from, from laziness and or disobedience toward the master. And those bags of money, the bags of silver, what are they... What do they represent? Truly, this, this parable is more than not just a lesson in, in banking and investing. These bags of, of silver, they represent all the resources that God blesses us with on a daily basis. The resource of time. And sure, but our financial resources. The resources of our, our unique talents and abilities that each of us are blessed with. And just like it was for those three servants, our responsibilities are different. We all have different responsibilities commensurate with the, the gifts and the talents and the resources that God blesses us with. But the expectation is always the same. We all have different abilities and different talents and responsibilities. But the expectation of the master is always the same. The expectation is that we'll invest our God-given gifts. We'll invest our time. We'll invest our resources wisely. So the issue is, is not how much we have, but how well we use what we have. The issue is not how much we have, but for the master, the issue is how well we use what we have. Now this parable describes the consequences of, of two different attitudes towards Jesus' promised return. There's a person who, who diligently prepares for Jesus' return by investing their God-given time and talents in the service of God. And it's, it's interesting to note that, that all three servants, they look at those bags, they, they acknowledge, recognize that those, those bags of silver, those, that resource that the master left with, they all recognize that that's not their bag, it's the master's bag. Now they all got that part right. They all got that part right. It's not theirs. Our gifts aren't ours. Our gifts are the masters given to us to invest. And even all three of the servants, even the one that, that you know, followed out at the end, who's now gnashing his teeth and failing, even he understood that part. The person who diligently prepares for, prepares for Jesus' return by investing the, their God-given talents to serve God, that's the, that's the first person. And this person will be rewarded in this life with more responsibility. They'll be rewarded with more opportunities to grow the master's kingdom here on earth, just as it is in heaven. And don't we all see that as well in the normal course of our lives? You know, we've all had jobs in which, you know, at least I guess the goal is to get promoted, right? You want to get promoted so that, sure, you can make more money, but also get promoted so you can have more responsibility. So you can do more good across a larger area for more people with the gifts that God has given you. But the person who wastes their God-given talents or, or hoards their God-given talents, they'll be punished. Sounds harsh. That's exactly what it says. And it makes sense because we serve a God who is a God of justice. So why would those who were unfaithful be rewarded with the same reward as those who faithfully invested their God-given resources? That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be just. So that's kind of what this parable means and what, what it's pointing to. But the question, of course, always is, what does it mean to us here and now? 
Now, we all know that Jesus will return. So when that happens, whenever it happens, will you be ready? So what can you do now to prepare for that, that inevitability? Well, like those crazy X gamers that, that we talked about at the beginning, you can, you can live your life all in. And I think that's, that's as much of an attitude as anything else. You know, we're blessed. We were blessed this morning, and hopefully we'll be blessed again tomorrow morning. You know, we'll wake up with a full day, full 24 hours ahead of us. It's a blessing. What are we going to do for the kingdom in those 24 hours? Are we going to be all in for God, or are we going to hoard some of that, that gift of time that God has blessed us all with and use it to some selfish end, some selfish end that denies somebody else? Some of the gifts that we've received from God. That doesn't mean we all got to run off and be missionaries and lower Botswana or something. That's not. We just means that that we have to be all in. Whether that whether we're having a day off, we are all in on our day off. And we're thanking God for it. We're enjoying that day off. God is glorified when we when we enjoy His blessing. Sometimes that is time off. Friday for me. I didn't do much for anybody else. I don't think. I drove around my poor bed for a couple hours. Um, but I enjoyed it. And it was, it was recreating. All in. Whatever we do, we do all in. You know, I've told the Breaking Bonds guys, when I've, I've been, had the opportunity to teach their class, that, that in terms of going all in for God, I learned early on. I think it was back in the, in the military. I had to do some Six Sigma, some process management training. And, and one of the things I was talking about was, was leaders should never try to accomplish more than six things in any given day. You know, we all have our to-do to lists, and the philosophy of these, these process in, engineering folks would say that you should never put more than six to-dos for any given day, because you're just gonna frustrate yourself. And if you do any, try to do any more than that, they're, you're gonna do them halfway, and they won't. So I, I did that. I mean, all the way through my military career, and corporate career, and, and even into ministry, I always have six things that I'm going to accomplish every day. Until about my, I don't know, maybe my first or second year here. And it occurred to me that, hey, six isn't enough. But <laughs> it occurred to me that I could never get, I could usually get four things, big things done every day, but I could never get six. And then I remember reading this, this text and, and part of my Bible study and and what I began doing, instead of trying to do all the six things Brian wants to do, is I started leaving the first two blank. I made a list, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I would only put Brian tasks on three, four, five, or six. The first two were blank. The first two were God. Whatever God wanted me to do that day. That's what it means to be all in for God. Sure, I have things i got to accomplish. We all have things we've got to accomplish every day. But being all in for God means having the courage to say, you know what, I'm going to leave the first two blank because those are God. God gets the first two shots of whatever I'm going to do today. And I started doing that, and it was kind of cool because what I noticed was, invariably, is I, would, I usually get there before the staff does by a half hour or so, and I make out my list and kind of get my head on straight before they all roll in. And uh, I started noticing that during those times that I would otherwise put pass in there, Somebody will invariably call, hey, Pastor, can I talk to you? I got something going on, and I didn't plan on doing that, but that person would come in, and I'd have, God had that person in mind, and they needed their pastor that day. Had I made a list of six things, I, I would have been frustrated, because I would have been doing that instead of what I wanted to do, but I left that to God. And I've noticed that I get a lot more done. Not what Brian wants to get done. But what God wants Brian to get done during that day. And that, I think, is what it means to be all in for God. It's waking up every morning and deciding that whatever you want done today, I'm in. Here's what I think I need to do. God, what do you think I need to do? And the other reason I think this is so important for us to think about but this particular Sunday is our Lenten journey starts well, on Wednesday. 
And so, back to that original question that I asked, are you all in? That's a, that's a hard question to answer. But that's the perfect kind of question to contemplate and to give to God during this Lenten journey. Because the thing about Lent, it's, it's not a time us Methodists are really good about going out and doing stuff out there all the time, running to the border and helping people out and, and you know, whatever. We're, we're very social, we're very outwardly focused, which is good. But it's also a great recipe for running out of gas. And are we doing the right thing? Are we all in on the right thing? So what I'm saying is that Lent is that perfect time for, for not so much doing stuff out there, but this time of introspection where we ask God, hey, am I all in? And if I am all in, God, am I in all in on the things you want me to do? Am I all in on the things I want to do? That's what Lent's for, is asking God those questions like that. Because Jesus will return, and we will be called to account for the gifts, the talents, the resources that he's given to us. And have we squandered them? Have we buried them? Or have we used them to advance God? That's the question we'll be left with. Amen. Now please stand and uh, let's uh, say together the Apostles' Creed, which is on page 8, page 1. <laughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Now please continue standing as we sing, I Surrender All, we'll sing verses 1, 4, and 5, it's number 364. be seated. As we share prayer time together today, I remind you of the list of names on the back side of our order of service. I trust you'll take time and, and peruse through those names. Many of them you'll recognize, some you won't. 
but each one of them is precious in God's sight and the request in prayer of his people. And today as we pray together, we want to lift up those names before God and ask guidance and for the presence of the Holy Spirit to lead. And of course, there's many other needs among us that beyond the names that are here. So we don't want to forget those as well. So as we pray today, we want to remember each of their names. And please notice the names, new names that were added. Added Penny Schultz, that's Ryan Boswell's aunt. We want to remember Don Mowry. Don Mowry is out of the hospital and is doing fine. And there's several other names there that's been on there for a while. We want to continue to remember them. And also we want to remember uh, Dave Hopkins' brother, who's going to have heart surgery. We want to remember his brother in our prayers today, as well as many others that may come to mind as we pray together. So let us pray. Lord, you promise to be with us. We felt your presence here in the message today. We have felt the reality of serving you in our daily walk. Now we come before you with the needs of our people. And we recognize you know those needs better than any of us know. We only know that each and every individual is precious in your sight. And we know that each and every name is on this list because either they have asked that it be on the list or a neighbor or family member has asked it to be on the member list. So today we place these before you and acknowledge your presence to be with each and every individual. And if any of that, we know that we serve a God who promises to be with us. And we trust that promise now as we place before you each and every individual. Not only these do we place before you, but also the many other needs that we face daily. <clears throat> In this broken world, Lord, we know there's many needs beyond the walls of our building today that touches each one of us. So we pray for those needs for leaders of nations that are in conflict. We pray, Lord, for local leaders of, of our local community, of our state, and of our nation. May your Holy Spirit give guidance and direction as we enter this most important week of our, of our year, as we realize the importance of Lent, and as we acknowledge the fact that we rededicate ourselves to the highest and best that we know. So Lord, it's in that spirit we lift up each and every name before you and pray your will be done on earth as it's done in heaven. These favors and blessings we ask in the name of the one who taught each one of us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. get back to God some of our first and our best with our gifts, tithes, and offerings.
God, thank you for loving us. We can only love one another because you loved us first. Lord, accept these gifts, these gifts of love, and use them, multiply them, and magnify them so that they can be light to love in someone else's life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn, which is Here I Am, Lord. Number 593, we'll sing the first and third verse. worship experience this morning, we've offered ourselves to the Lord. Now, we are going beyond the walls of this building to do the work we promised to do, to be people of God. There will be days when we will be wondering and, and wonder what, what we're doing and why we're doing it. But if God is calling us, God is going to direct us. So we believe that our mission at beyond the walls of this building is there because God has called us to be there. So go today in peace and know that you're not alone in the process. God's promised you nothing can happen but what God's promised you with us. Go in peace and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Everybody is welcome to fellowship in the rotunda directly after the service.